Thanks, like, and subscribe. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Roger Ver, otherwise known as Bitcoin Jesus. Roger, welcome back. Always fun to be with you. All right, now, Roger, uh, you're here in Aspen, having flown straight from Hong Kong, a Bitcoin conference over there. Uh, quite a few prominent mainland Chinese Bitcoin executives have been kept away due to threats from the Chinese government. Bobby Lee, of course, is over there. Has he, in other words, so the Chinese government is really cracking down on Bitcoin. They've actually gone to the point of saying that executives in the Bitcoin space, they don't want them to leave, et cetera. What's going on? Uh, I wish I could tell you more, but that's, you've summed it up pretty well. The Chinese government asked them not to leave the area, and uh, it sounded like it was implied that bad things might happen if some of them left uh, the area. So a number of uh, people were not at the conference in Hong Kong because they were uh, asked not to leave the area. And uh, in my opinion, if someone asks you not to leave the area, that's probably a pretty good signal that you should leave the area as soon as you possibly can. So uh, China is really, you know, cracking down on Bitcoin. Um, why? Maybe they're starting to figure out that Bitcoin empowers the individual to have complete control over their own finances and their own life. But if you look uh, historically at the things that China has tried to ban, uh, they've all turned out to be incredibly good investments. So you have YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Google. If you invested in those things, uh, you would do fantastic. And I think the same is probably true with uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So it's a buy signal. It's probably a buy signal. I do think so. Go long. Well, that's another, I guess, question is, you know, we're in the 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 range. What, where do you see things heading over the next couple of years? Cryptocurrencies obviously are incredibly useful and their supply is scarce, so the price is going to continue to go up, 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 uh, just like anything that's useful and scarce. Roger Ver, definitely your name is associated with Bitcoin Cash. So tell us, uh, is that a good, is that fair to associate you with Bitcoin Cash? What is it? Uh, why do you get associated with it? And fill folks in, because since the last time you were on, we've had this fork. And so bring us up to date. So there's been lots and lots of internal politics and fighting within Bitcoin. But if you read the Bitcoin white paper itself, it clearly defines Bitcoin as a chain of digital signatures. Uh, the SegWit version of Bitcoin gets rid of those digital signatures. So by the very definition given in the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, a SegWit Bitcoin transaction is not a Bitcoin transaction. So from my point of view, Bitcoin Cash is the real Bitcoin. Uh, and so Bitcoin Cash is on the same roadmap that the original Bitcoin from day one was. And then just within the last year, a bunch of people managed to veer it off and intentionally make the SegWit version of Bitcoin. And they've intentionally made it have high fees. They've intentionally made it have long confirmation times. They've intentionally made it less useful in business. And Bitcoin Cash is still useful in business, has low fees, fast confirmation times. Uh, it just doesn't have as much infrastructure built up uh, upon it. But uh, I'm really, really bullish on Bitcoin Cash. I've been selling a, a portion of my SegWit Bitcoins for more Bitcoin Cash. Right, so returning to the theme of China, of course, China was until recently kind of the biggest area for mining. Uh, you have Bitmain, which is uh, they manufacture chips as well as they're also mining. Uh, they seem to be um, supportive of this Bitcoin Cash move. Is that a conflict of interest? I think it seems really clear that the vast majority of people that are actually using Bitcoin in commerce prefer Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin SegWit. The vast majority of people whose background is in business or in economics prefer Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin SegWit. And uh, I fall squarely in that camp. I can't count how many Bitcoin transactions I do both myself personally and for my company every single day. And Bitcoin Cash is much more useful for that than, uh, than Bitcoin SegWit at this point. So the question is, uh, you, you put out the value proposition for Bitcoin Cash. In this business, in this industry, in this world, you need miners to support it. And Will we see uh, miners, wh what will be the incentive for miners to kind of jump ship, if you will, or jump camps from the Bitcoin, or you're calling it SegWit Bitcoin, to a Bitcoin Cash environment? Um, it, it, because there doesn't, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be a huge interest in that. But so where do you see that going? I think the miners are always going to mine whatever coin is the most profitable for them to mine. So on our Bitcoin.com mining pool, the users can, they click one button and it'll automatically point their hash rate at whichever version of Bitcoin is the most profitable to mine. And then probably within the next week, it'll automatically set it up so they get paid in whichever version of Bitcoin they want to be paid in. So it'll mine whichever one's most profitable and they'll get paid in whichever one's most useful. And I think that's 
what everybody wants out of life. They want to earn the most money and they want the least amount of work. So. Okay, so you mentioned earlier that businesses like this Bitcoin Cash, businesses would be include folks like uh, BitPay, I believe, is one of the earliest and one of the biggest businesses, and um, a few others out there who have an interest in cryptocurrency and in Bitcoin, which differs from, let's call it the cypherpunk movement or the cypher. So I, I don't think that's really fair. So okay. I, I consider myself a cypherpunk. I've been interested in all of these things since I was a teenager and reading books and you know all, all sorts of things on that. And so I think that there's people that could use the cypherpunk name that are on both sides of this issue. But I think the ones with a stronger economics background prefer Bitcoin Cash and the ones with a more a stronger computer science background maybe prefer uh, the Bitcoin SegWit. But there's people on both sides of, of this camp uh, on, on every issue from every background. You mentioned the economics there. There's a concept out there called hyper-Bitcoinization. Uh, I think the Nakamoto Institute, one of the guys over there, came up with this uh, idea. Um, basically that Bitcoin eats the world, or something the equivalent to Bitcoin eats the world. Fiat currency goes the way of all dinosaurs. What's your thought on that? I think cryptocurrency is going to take over the world. I think previously it would have been possible that Bitcoin could really just take over and really have the lion's share, but Bitcoin's first uh, mover advantage has really been damaged by these people that have intentionally made Bitcoin have high fees and slow confirmation times. And uh, that's the version of Bitcoin SegWit at this point, and that's why I like Bitcoin Cash. Let's talk about November, because apparently there's another fork coming in November. So can you set it up a little bit, like where is this fork coming from? and then talk a little bit about wh where you see that uh, developing. Sure, so like something, the high 90 plus percent of the, the miners and the businesses involved in Bitcoin all came together and agreed on a compromise of a Bitcoin SegWit 2X, including myself and Bitcoin.com. So all of our existing infrastructure uh, at Bitcoin.com on that day will follow the SegWit 2X chain per this New York agreement. A number of people on the internet think it's the end of the world if that happens, and they're saying that you could never ever increase the block size from one megabyte to two megabyte, but that's a, another example of central planning. Like, it's one megabyte for the block size is pretty much guaranteed to be wrong, because we don't know what the right size for the amount of block space is, but it's almost for sure not one megabyte. It's either half a megabyte or three quarters of a megabyte or a thousand megabytes. We don't know what it is, but it's guaranteed not to be one megabyte. Right, the idea of having big uh, blocks uh, it seems to favor uh, kind of the mining community over the developing community. That's the way it's positioned in, in, the, in, in the circles of the crypto circles. And that mining concentration would seem uh, to go against the idea of, of, of a distribution, a distributed network. Uh, comment on that. That's the way that one small group of developers are trying to position this, but there's a whole bunch of other developers that don't see it that way. And it's also worth pointing out that the miners are some of the Bitcoin users with the most skin in the game. The miners, all of their income is in Bitcoin. All of those Bitcoin that they received, they didn't have to spend. They have all this uh, capital de you know, devoted to, to running all this mining equipment. So the Bitcoin miners are some of the strongest Bitcoin users around the world. So uh, I don't think it's fair to try and demonize Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin miners are some of the most devoted Bitcoin users in the world. Okay, uh, fair enough. Now, you had a phrase here at the, uh, the conference in Aspen, which I hadn't heard before, which is really something. You know, people say we have to uh, bank the unbanked. And your post to this was, we're going to try to unbank the banked. In other words, we're trying to take down the Jamie Diamonds of the world. Um, talk about that a little bit. And specifically, Jamie Diamond and JP Morgan, they are really got to be in their bonnet. They, they have a sense an existential crisis with this Bitcoin thing. Your thoughts? So uh, to be fair, I, I borrowed that phrase from Thomas over at Omise Go, but I thought it was such a fantastic uh, thing. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it so that we're, we can unbank the banks. So people don't even need banks anymore. They could be 100% in charge of their own money. And Jamie Dimon wouldn't be all upset and, and you know riled up about this if it wasn't a big threat, if it didn't make it so people don't need banks anymore. If, if, if Bitcoin was stupid and a scheme and a Ponzi scam, uh, he wouldn't worry about it one bit at all. But instead, he's really worried about it because he knows this is something big. This is a fundamental shift in the way in which the world works. I have a theory. I want your thoughts about it. Uh, I brought it up at this conference, um, kind of just cooked this up in the last few days, that we could see we're entering into like a new space race where, remember, the Sputnik went up and the Russians and uh, the U.S. entered the space race and landed a man on the moon. If Bitcoin is seen as a strategic reserve and something equal or better than gold and countries start accumulating it as such, would countries get into this uh, game theory, Bitcoin environment on a geopolitical level? 
um, and it could be played out on a much bigger scale. Um, what we see uh, for the last few years kind of on a smaller scale. Your thoughts? Maybe. <laughs> I think any smart politician should be paying attention to this. So the country that adopts Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies first has this giant first mover advantage. So it would be incredibly short-sighted for any politician to try and shun cryptocurrencies and push them out of their country. Any smart politician or government person would be inviting them to come in as quick as they possibly can because there's going to be this giant transfer of wealth to cryptocurrencies. And we're seeing that happen right before our eyes. So. You should want that to happen in your own country if you're a politician. You got the, uh, the conference here. You launched pretty much a new initiative and uh, always, I uh, think, pushing the envelope in this space. Certainly, Roger Vera from the very beginning, I think, has been associated. One of the two or three people that's always been associated with, with uh, Bitcoin and crypto. And you haven't rested on your laurels, always pushing things forward. And so tell us, uh, I missed the, the speech, but from what I gather, you're starting a country? Roger, what's going on? Yeah, so I, I think actually we're starting a non-country is the idea. Uh, so we've already raised more than $100 million from uh, private investors. We're exploring ways in which we can allow the public to participate as well. But the idea is, and I, I think we'll raise somewhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars, and we're going to go around to different governments around the world and say, sell us a piece of land and grant us sovereignty with that land. And within that land, we'll then auction it off, and then anybody can basically, it'll be the world's first free society where you won't have this parasitic class bossing everybody around and demanding that they pay rent in the form of taxes on what they're doing. And uh, I think it'll be a fantastic experiment. So if you're already a libertarian, of course you'll love our project. If you're not a libertarian and you think libertarians are stupid, you should love our project because you'll have a place you can point and say, look at all those stupid libertarians and how bad they screw things up. So no matter what your political viewpoint is, you should support our project. Right, and apparently there's some deals available in the, uh, you know, in the path of uh, Hurricane Irma. There's, uh, the things are for sale down there. Yeah, yes? We, we've been in touch with actually quite a few governments already, and it's been uh, actually really, really pleasantly surprising just how interested they are. When uh, these government people hear money, money, they, they, their ears perk right up and they're interested. So. I think, um, I think the, the chairman of um, the Virgin Group, uh, Branson, he, I think he might put Necker Island up for sale. The thing got totally scraped. You can move right in there. Ready to go. Maybe that can be on our short list of potential <laughs> locations. This has uh, been, uh, as always, illuminating. Where's your next stop on the, the Great Roger Tour? Where are you heading next? Uh, headed uh, to Silicon Valley next. Excellent. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Max. All right, well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Roger Ver. If you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all. Today's the day. No more oppression under Eric. It's go time. Okay.